please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Trading Hour. Uh, I'm Prashant Nair. With me is my colleague Ekta Batra. The markets are at the day's lowest point, half a percent down right now, 10,741. Uh, and uh, broadly speaking, uh, things are seemingly under pressure. Overnight, uh, things did not help. I mean, U.S. markets were a little bit lower. There wasn't very much on yields or dollar. Uh, and uh, I mean, oil prices, which had corrected quite significantly over Friday and the first half of yesterday, uh, sort of uh, rose. So uh, there is the big OPEC meeting Friday and Saturday, so we'll know what finally happens. Uh, but it's not really going into the meeting in a very, very, I mean, in a, in a, in a big sell-off kind of a fashion. It's now steady. It's off the highs. I mean, I think that is definitely welcome, but I mean, it's not really uh, coming lower. The other big uh, point, I think, which is not being uh, talked about too much right now is because I think, I mean, it's a, it's a bit jaded to keep talking about the U.S.-China uh, trade uh, sort of spat uh, not trade war, but a trade spat. But, I mean, it's heating up once again. Uh, you know, both sides are threatening to go tit for tat. Uh, I mean, I mean, I think uh, there was a news report in the Financial Times this morning that, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, Trump's White House is saying that we are considering tariffs on another $100 billion worth of Chinese imports into the U.S. So, you know, things seem to be escalating. And uh, if you read the commentary, I mean, that is being blamed for Asian markets broadly, Asian equity markets broadly being lower. So we'll uh, dwell on that in a bit more detail uh, as the day goes along. Uh, but for now, here, we are about 55 points lower. Ek the morning. Hi, Prashant. Yes, absolutely. And we have the mid-cap index, which is down around 126 odd points. So do watch out for that and the advanced decline ratio, because that seems even worse than what it was yesterday. At current reckoning, we have around 650 st 50 stocks odd advancing uh, with around 1,200 plus stocks, which are declining on the NSE. So you can just, or rather on the BSC. So you can just see the kind of uh, weakness in the breadth for the broader markets and whether or not that uh, worsens would be something that you should monitor through the day. But uh, nonetheless, a lot of stocks in focus. So we have the likes of HPCL, IOC, BPCL, all of these stocks which are seeing some amount of profit booking. I would keep my eye out on what's happening with Dr. Reddy's because there is follow-on buying which is taking place today as well. So up around 1% right now and up 24% on a month-to-date basis. And a couple of other stocks include something like, obviously, ICIC Bank on the back of news. But let's get talking about the technicals of the market now. We have Sudarshan Sukhani joining in for that. So that Hi, morning over to you for the Nifty. What would you recommend with sub 10,800 as well as stocks? Yeah, <laughs> good morning again. See, after a big gap down, we are buyers in the Nifty. The trend has not changed. It's in a trading range and we have this move towards support and then a right resistance. But the overall move for the Nifty is still on the upside. So at current levels, I would suggest that the Nifty is a buying opportunity for intraday traders with a stop under 10,720. That's the futures rate. And then we see what happens during the day. Don't carry the position, but consider going long at current levels. Stock-wise also, I'm more bullish than bearish. See, uh, trading ranges sometimes give the impression of big moves, but essentially they are where they were. So within these moves, we want to go and buy the stronger stocks, starting with Torrent Pharma, Torrent Pharma is a buying opportunity, as is most of Pharma. Ekta, I've been talking about how Pharma is bottoming out, hmm. entering a new bull market. It's my favorite sector now. Oh. So Torrent Pharma <laughs> is a buy for the day. <laughs> All right. Wow. It is, it's going to be the leader. Uh, Ekta, you're going to find that you're going to be speaking so much about Pharma now. It's going to lead the next bull market. Okay, but would that be okay. across uh, stocks? Because a lot of these stocks also suffer from perennial fundamental issues. You see, it's across stocks, but among those stocks, the ones that are suffering, as you explained, from fundamental issues will either underperform or not be part of it, but most of the leaders will be. So pharma is the sector to focus on. The second stock for today is Godrej Consumer Products. That uh, FMCG is doing well, and that should continue. So there are two buying opportunities, Torrent Pharma and Godrej Consumer Products for the day, and one short sell, Raymond's. Raymond is doing nothing. It's now breaking support levels. So that's a short sell. Okay. Uh, Sudarshan, uh, we have some uh, questions, I think, uh, for you. By the way, I mean, uh, what you have at the bottom of the screen is uh, what Asia is doing. 
I mean, and if you look at the cut across Asian markets, uh, India is holding out uh, much better. Half a percent cut here. Look at Shanghai, look at Japan, uh, you know, look at uh, the Chinese markets, uh, Hong Kong. So, I mean, uh, it's, uh, we are top of the list in a good way right now. Uh, but let's see if we follow suit uh, with what's happening in Asia. Well, the first question for Sudarshan is from Arvind Bhargava. He's looking for, an inv he's looking for investment advice, basically. He wants to know which of the following is a good investment for the long term. Godrej Properties, NCC, or IDFC? I mean, so varied from different sectors. Uh, uh, Sudarshan, what would you tell him? Well, IDFC and NCC are complete no's. You don't go and buy weak stocks. You just stay with the winners if you want to participate in the bull market. So what is left is Godrej Properties. It's luckily, it's an outperformer. Go and buy it and hold it for three years and you'll be pleased. And Prashant, I, my impression is that all this uh, talk about the trade war is just drama, isn't it? Yeah, looks like it. I mean, but uh, sometimes, <laughs> uh, you know, drama can also, I mean, I don't know. It's actually quite unreal, uh, real life imitating uh, what is going on uh, with uh, all those tweets, etc. But mm -hmm. markets are reacting. We like it or not, I think uh, markets are reacting. In fact, I just uh, want to, to point out, uh, you know, Prashant, that uh, currently we have the Hang Seng, which is down over 700 points. So it's mm. extended its losses as we speak. That's the Hong Kong markets. And even Shanghai is down around 3 odd percent. So compared to that, we are fairly resilient I in think, terms uh, of what we're doing. You know, it's too early to maybe, uh, so as uh, Sudarshan pointed out, it's a lot of drama. That is mm. true. But uh, there is also action in terms of uh, pe people actually imposing tariffs, right? I mean, India, mm. for example, we had reported it has imposed tariffs, uh, counter tariffs. Mm. So uh, w w I think what has happened is that people say, okay, trade war, we've been hearing about trade war for six months now, mm. right? I mean, markets have moved on. Uh, and also, uh, the last time we left, uh, stopped talking about trade war, it was the consensus was that there's no trade war. Mm. It is a trade spat, it's not going to escalate. I mean, that is a general consensus opinion. But I think every time you hear something new and mm. something big, $100 billion this morning, for example, right? Mm. Uh, so I think markets do get a, a, a bit spooked and they sort of revisit whether uh, what we earlier thought is true or maybe this will get out of hand. So that risk is always, uh, always, always there. Always there. Okay, but uh, Sudarshan, thank you very much for joining in this morning and taking us through all of your technical calls. We'll touch base with you later on in the day. Thank you very much. So that's Sudarshan Sakani talking on the technicals. Want to point out that even the Dow futures are showing a cut of around 250 odd points. Generally, they tend to recover as we go on, but nonetheless, just point out, just watch out for the Dow futures at this point. We have um, Gaurav Bissa talking about the FNO strategies that he has lined up as well. He's from LKP Securities. Gaurav, hi, over to you then. What are you recommending? Good morning. The first recommendation would be buy on uh, Kettle Healthcare. I was just uh, listening to your conversation that pharma being the flavor of the season. Uh, Kettle is one that has been in the consolidation between 370 390. It has now come out with consolidation. A volume breakout has been seen. Yesterday also we saw good amount of over addition happening. Uh, till till now about 2% over addition has been seen getting built. So fresh longs are seen getting built, uh, made a breakout on daily charts. So it, it looks ripe for tires of 425, 430. For immediate uh, basis, uh, one can play with small suppose of 400 and a small target of 415. Second would be sell on uh, coal pile. We have seen concession short portions getting built yesterday uh, to the tune of 4% shorts were seen getting built. Today also we are seeing 1% uh, uh, over addition happening. So there is a possibility that it may slip towards the level of uh, 1180. One can use a stop loss of 12, 10, 12, 12 and short uh, coal pal. <clears throat> All right. Thanks very much. Appreciate you joining in uh, with those uh, strategies. We'll speak with you again. Uh, so what? I mean, 60 points now. So we're slipping. If you look, the, look at the Nifty intraday, you'll see what I'm talking about. And I think it's happening in tandem with what's uh, the slip that we're seeing across uh, the rest of the Asian markets uh, as well. Uh, okay, I mean, you know, we'll focus on markets and uh, get you a global perspective as well in just a bit. But on to some CNBC TV18 exclusive now. We've got the Petroleum Minister who spoke with uh, my colleague Shireen Bhan about the subsidy issue for ONGC. Uh, and uh, he also essentially touched upon whether the government and the company that is Gas Authority of India is thinking about demerging uh, its transmission and marketing businesses into two separate entity entities. Here's a slice of that conversation. 
Uh, let me ask you, sir, because this is again a fear and a concern uh, that people, investors specifically have on uh, ONGC specifically. Uh, you know, ONGC in the past has been asked to bear some of the burden during the time of the UPA as well. The concern now is that LPG and kerosene, the subsidy burden, the subsidy bill is going to be higher on account of where we've seen crude prices. Will ONGC be pulled in to bear some of the burden this time around as well? Today, the subsidy burden, what, what amount it is per kerosene oil and LPG, it is uh, born from the budget. We are not burdening any of the companies. And that will not be a consideration in the future as well? Today, there is no burden on any company. Government is taking care of the subsidy burden from its own budget. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you're giving an assurance, sir, that while that may be the case today, this will not, if, if push comes to shove, uh, ONGC will not be asked to take on uh, some of the burden if it were to come to that. Let us see how things are unfolding. If price is uh, uh, increasing, the crude oil price is increasing, let's see how things are going. As in today, Government, is, uh, government has developed a model. There are three factors, and we are balancing all the three factors. We had seen a consolidation last year uh, in, in your sector. Uh, what about the possibility of a demerger at Gales? Uh, that is something that is being talked about. Uh, is that something that's uh, under consideration? Is it a priority at this point? Certainly. We are very much committed to have an end-to-end uh, 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 -end gas network in the country. Gale is mandated for, primarily mandated for building of the gas-based infrastructure. Mm. But in last few years, Gale has tremendously done good job in marketing network mm. also. There are two kind of model. It can be merged, it can be uh, de-bottleneck itself. Mm. So Gale is a very independent and competent company. They are working out some formula. I what I uh, in one of our review, our government's primary priority is how to create more infrastructure, hmm. how to create more gas-based network. I remember that you, when we last spoke, uh, you had said that the consolidation effort that you had started with uh, ONGC and HPC as integration will continue. Uh, can we expect Gale and IOC next? I don't know about that, but it's primary. Uh, my, my point is more effective business model is needed. Sometime it is through merger, sometime through, through the own bottle, de bottlenecking. Hmm. So let's see how things are unfolding. But they are Maharatan companies, they have their own board, they have their own decision making process. How they will behave, it is up to them. Hmm. Ekta, the thing about ONGC was the mm. one which is interesting because the stock is pricing in a fair bit of fear that eventually, that I mean, the easy. math is very clear. Uh, the government, what it budgeted for LPG and kerosene subsidy mm. Uh, mm. for F519 is about five months short. I mm. mean, if oil prices were to stay where they are, they already don't have money for about five five months of I this know. year. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, will uh, will the government provide more money or will the ONGC be asked to share subsidy? I mean, if you remember, there was this talk that ONGC will be uh, allowed to make uh, a recovery mm -hmm. of you know, a certain amount, and after that, the government is going to uh, take those revenues. So, I mean, uh, the oil minister didn't commit. He said, as of today, there is no so need. It is, so the option is on the table, very much I mean, on looks the like table. It, right? Otherwise, mm -hmm. he would have clearly said that no matter what, oil prices go up. I mean, it's a public company. We will not ask mm -hmm. them to share a subsidy. We will not. Mm -hmm. He said, we will see I mean, mm -hmm. if oil prices continue to rise. Okay, so an important statement coming in there from the oil minister. But nonetheless, for Gale currently, that stock is up around 1.3%, but it's really the oil marketing companies which are taking a hit. So we've been pointing out how HPCL, BPCL, IOC, all of these stocks are down anywhere between 2 to 3 odd percent. Take a break now. But up next, we're going to be discussing uh, the commodity space. We'll, uh, in fact, discuss the expectations from the OPEC this weekend. Peter McGuire, the CEO. Welcome back. Let's shift focus away from equities now. Manisha Gupta is here to tell us what she's tracking in the commodity space. And no prizes for guessing, it is oil. Oh, yes, it is. And a very, very volatile market that's beginning to be. We saw 2% of surge in the New York session yesterday. But in the Asian markets right now, we have seen some pressure come back. So, yeah, it is going to be about the OPEC Vienna meeting, the trade tensions between U.S. and China, the Goldman Sachs report, which says that $82 is back or perhaps would be back by this summer. And, of course, the increase in U.S. production. So there are just whole host of all of those factors to take cues from. But joining us on the show now is Peter McQuire, who is headed to Vienna. Peter, hi, you are going for that all-important meeting. What is your sense? What are you hearing? And what kind of a decision really can we expect from this OPEC meeting this time? 
Well, I think where we're looking at, you know, it's going to be a very interesting lead up to Friday's meeting and then what actually transpires. You've got one camp, naturally, the Saudis and the Russians and, and, uh, and their cohort. And then the other camp, of course, the, the Venezuela and Iran. Uh, there seems to be a disconnect between the two parties. I'm not sure whether they'll broker a deal in the short run, you know, leading into Wednesday and Thursday. But it's not unusual for observers to um, take on board the, the essence of OPEC that can change during that actual day itself. So as they meet and as you see different parties playing and playing to their strengths and trying to get a cohesive unit, I think it's going to be a very interesting meeting. You've seen what's happened over the last matter of two years with those production cuts and now it comes to a different point of view. Well, absolutely. While there is, of course, a lot of uncertainty as we get into this meeting, Peter, but depending on what OPEC could do, whether it is about increasing supplies or keeping it uh, as a status quo, in both the events, where do you see the crude oil prices headed? I think it'll probably, uh, um, it'll be range bound. I can't see any big breakups break to the upside or to the downside unless you see some geopolitical concerns or weather outages the US dollar has had a very, very strong uptick over the last matter of months, and it's sitting now at 95 for that US dollar index. There's probably further upside there, naturally, with Fed rate rises leading into the rest of 2018. So uh, Brent, I think, will probably trade that 70 to $75 range. You may see a little bit higher, but it just depends on what the production cuts are. And WTI, I think it's going to be range bound 62 to 66 for, you know, over the next couple of months. But remembering weather outages can greatly impact price quickly with the hurricane season starting in the US in the next, you know, matter of weeks. So it's always an unknown when you're looking at that mother nature impact of pricing. Mm. And it's not just the crude oil prices, Peter, because uh, a lot of those cues really seem to be translating into the metal prices, which have declined for a third straight day. We, of course, have seen weak Chinese data. The whole U.S.-China trade retaliation is yet another thing. And, of course, the strength in U.S. dollar. Which one of these factors, really, are you watching closely? I think that's going to be a further softness over the next couple of weeks. Again, you know, that, that US dollar strength and the uneasiness or the uncertainty as far as trade wars. And the heat's come out of the metal market, you know, in the last matter of a week or so. Uh, Dow's down five successive sessions. So, you know, all of these factors at play need to just be absorbed into the market and from a volatility side. Crude oil's down. Uh, it had a bounce overnight. So, you know, it may take... Um, uh, it may, you know, edge up higher over the next couple of days, but there are just so many moving parts when you're looking at the, you know, to try and forecast price movement in the short to medium term. It's certainly a trader's um, perfect storm at the moment because of those large swings, and they've just got to be very mindful from stop losses and, of course, uh, where, the, uh, where the market's trending. I think you'll see some whip soaring, and that's not uncommon leading into OPEC meetings, and that'll naturally wash across to the metal market. Oh, yes, all the emerging markets, or rather all these sectors really would be watching out for that OPEC meeting. But one final question, Peter, and, you know, so while there is so much volatility across board, whether it's equities, currencies, or commodities as well, which is a better trade that you see emerging in all of these sectors? I think you'd probably have to look at, you know, US dollar. If you're going to be a trader, you've got to be... It's hard to go against the Fed at the moment. And that further upside there is going to be very, very nice for, uh, you know, FX traders. The, the market seems to be um, one-way traffic. And, you know, if it takes a 96 or 97 handle for that US dollar index, I think that that's going to really underpin from, a, from you know, the, uh, the strength of it, probably softness in gold. And uh, at the moment, it seems to be a nice trade to be involved in. So, yeah, possibly short metals. Um, oil will probably, you know, oscillate and go a little bit sideways, but it'd have to be strong US dollar, and that's going to be, you know, a trade to, you know, absorb and be a part of over the next couple of weeks. Oh, well, point taken, Peter. Thank you so much for joining us. So that clearly is a top trade emerging. Further strength in US dollar, but weakness in gold. And the base metal price, is, there's an advice of going short on that yet again for the next couple of weeks at least. All right, uh, Manisha, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate you joining in and taking us through those details. Michael Avery of Rabobank Bank is now joining in uh, to talk about what we're seeing uh, with the sell-off in Asian equity markets. Michael, thanks very much. Uh, you know, now, uh, should we say that uh, the market has been kind of slow to wake up to 
what now seems like a legitimate uh, sort of uh, trade situation between the U.S. and China. Overnight, we had Trump asking the USTR to, uh, you know, look at the possibility of imposing another 10 percent tariff on about $200 billion worth of Chinese imports. Your thoughts? Well, um, I think the market wasn't slow. I think the market was in ludicrous denial, to be fair. Um, there, there have been several of us, including myself, vocally pointing out the reasons why trade pressures were arising between the U.S. and China and all the different reasons why they were going to erupt at some point and how serious it would be when they did. But the market continues to do what the market does, which is shrug everything off and put it flat in the face by it. And now it has been flat in the face by it. Okay. Uh, Michael, in your sense now, how much of an incremental correction could we see from current levels for, say, the Asian markets, if you're talking about that? Because Shanghai is already at a two-year low. Well, to be honest, I don't even focus on this particularly on the equities front. I understand that's what you guys are looking at primarily. I'm, I'm more worried about what it means for actual businesses in terms of seeing their supply chains disrupted or loss of access to markets overnight, which is pretty much what it means for a lot of my clients. Um, if you're looking just more generally at equities, it depends country by country. But I cannot find a single argument that says this is going to be good because you're going to have real businesses disrupted, as I just said. That means real earnings rather than mm. you know, fudged accounting uh, actually genuinely being hit. At the same time, you're going to have a stronger U.S. dollar, which is negative for emerging markets in general. And you've got a backdrop of global uncertainty. I don't see how that's positive in the slightest. Mm. Uh, you know, th many people are still going to say that uh, these tariffs are, have been threatened, not imposed yet. Uh, you know, so they, again, are going to try and find a way, a, fair, a way around it. I mean, I'm, again, I'm talking about the market folks, Michael. How would you, uh, how, how would you, what would your opinion be? Now, is this at the, at the point where we can call this a trade war? Well, I think when you're talking about 50 billion in tariffs hmm. between the two, um, which is what we had on Friday, that was a trade spat, a mm. nasty one, but a spat. When mm. you now have $250 billion, which is what the U.S. is going to be imposing, mm. they haven't announced where or when, but 250 is now the figure. And if China dares to lift a finger, which it must, China cannot back off on this. Mm. Xi Jinping cannot be seen to be weak. You're talking full $50 billion, which, by the way, for, for the listeners, that's 90%, 90% of Chinese exports to the U.S. will now have a tariff on them if that happens. That's a trade war by, by any standard. And from China's uh, you know, perspective, as well as the U.S. perspective, neither can blink. They, neither of them want this, let's be honest. But the U.S. wants China to change its economic model, and China won't change its economic model. So what we have like, is a nuclear arms race here, with both sides have to build more and more terrible weapons to threaten the other one with more and more terrible destruction. But at least you know, in the nuclear front, you had this standoff where everyone could get on with their lives with the nuclear weapons in the background. This is going to be disrupting our lives because China will have to find some way to respond to the U.S. above and beyond trade because it can't put $450 billion of tariffs on because it only buys around $150 billion from the U.S. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I know you're you know, not focusing that much in terms of equities, Michael, but what would your view be on India? Because I just want to give you a statistic. The MSCI Emerging Markets Index is down close to around 5% year to date, and uh, the Nifty back home is up around 1 odd percent. So we're fairly resilient as of now, and we've recovered quite a bit as well. Uh, what's your sense for where India would be as things unfold? Well, I mean, really, when, when you're making any kind of equity prediction for any country, it's just throwing a dark at a board, isn't it? Hmm. But uh, all I can say is, in general terms, I can't see a positive backdrop for emerging markets here. Hmm. The only positive thing I can say about India is you're not a large exporter. Hmm. You're not a country that's reliant on earning dollars the same way that, say, China is, the same way that Southeast Asia is. You know, you have a large domestically focused economy, and I've argued continuously for the past four or so years at some point, that was going to be very useful when the global bank drop went sour. And this may be, maybe I stress, exactly that turning sour moment where you have to look inwards and say, hey, look, we have a huge and growing population. You know, we're building things to sell to people locally. What do we care if these two giants are taking each other on? The only mm -hmm. area where it becomes painful is a stronger US dollar, which is going to be quite, quite difficult for you, although hopefully that will 
squash commodity prices, and that might balance out in terms of inflation. Mm. But uh, really, I'm clutching at straws to try and find a positive in what is a very negative scenario. <laughs> Michael, thanks very much. Appreciate you joining in uh, with that perspective. Uh, always useful, always blunt, and uh, good to hear Michael's views on uh, this issue and others. So uh, markets across Asia are lower. And uh, by the way, I mean, you've got U.S. stock index futures also down. I think the Dow futures were down about 290, 300 points. Uh, so I think today is essentially swinging to global tune. And uh, it's not really in a very upbe upbeat tune right now. We take a very quick break here. We come back and we discuss market technicals. Mitesh Thakkar is uh, with us.